Hey, today we're going to continue with the series of talking with great salespeople. And today we've got a veteran, somebody who's been doing sales quite a while and spent an extensive amount of time at one company and became really good. He came highly recommended, uh, and I really enjoyed the interview. When we get into the distinctions between great salespeople and just okay salespeople, and what keeps coming up are very similar points about outward mindset, about being able to connect with another human being, about it being a performance, about the grit that it takes to show up every day and to have not only the right mindset, skill set, and attitude to really do well in sales. And I'll sum it up at the end. Uh, but I also want to make sure if you're in the courses already, check out the office hours. Uh, they're becoming very interactive versus just a Q&A and case study. We're getting a lot of contribution from all the people participating, coming up with uh, new tools that are out there, new techniques. And you get to hear how other people are doing it, as well as the one-on-ones, which is the very final chapter where you get to hear the full life cycle of how to get a meeting in your particular marketplace, uh, the exact steps, examples, and feedback of how it's working. So it's really starting to cook with the community side of it. I'm really excited about that. Also, check out our partners over at PipeDrive. PipeDrive is crushing it. If you're looking for a CRM or a way of keeping track of your activities, it's connected up with your inbox and your calendar to be able to have all these things that are pretty inexpensive, but insanely powerful and easy to use. The number one characteristics that you want in a CRM or a sales automation tool. Check it out at pipedrive.com with the brutal truth coupon code, all one word. I put it all in the show notes as well. And our friends over at CoVideo. Video email is one of those ways of people seeing you as another mammal another human being instead of a pitch person. All I see on LinkedIn and YouTube is, oh, different ways of doing the same old pitch. Well, guess what? That's what robocalls are. We are human beings and mammals. We got to understand how to connect because people don't think, they react. So if you are out there thinking that they're thinking, you're wrong. They react. It's that mammal brain takes over every time. Here we go with the interview. I think you're going to really enjoy it. The sound at the very beginning is a little off, but it gets much, much better. So hold on. Hey, Roger. Welcome to the show. Is a way of getting started. Tell us about yourself. Brian, great to meet you. Great to meet you. Big fan. So, um, yeah, um, I'm a 30-plus year veteran of, of the sales uh, profession. Um, been selling a number of products over my years. I started off working for Shell Oil. Uh, then I worked for ADP. And for the last 30 years, I've been working for American Express as a, a not only a salesperson, but a sales leader as well. So cool. a lot of that in the business consumer, but most of it in the business to business space. Yeah. And what did you sell when you were at Amex? Um, I, I was a leader and sold in the merchant services space. So um, a lot of the household names you know today, where hopefully you're a card member and you can go and use your card there. I probably was there before you end up a lot of those folks so that they could accept the card for pain. Okay. okay. And who did you call on? Uh, typically, you know, a broad range of people. Um, you know, we like to start high and work back. So um, the brand name uh, got us in the door quite a bit. So I would yeah. tell you, we started in the C-suite and we generally got a receptive uh, response and then would work back through the decision-making in an organization. But um Generally, top-down selling worked for us with a mandate from the top that they were interested in exploring the product, and then we would use that mandate to advance the sales process at the lower levels where people did all the work. And so you had to uh, uh, change a lot of people's minds? You had... Uh... Yeah, I, I don't think in uh, the 30 years that I sold Amex or close to it that anyone ever called up and said, we'd like to take the card. Um, I think everybody we had to convince uh, that there was a reason for them to pay more to accept our card. And, uh, you know, the product is really strong. The brand name is, 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 is Teflon. It's, it's hugely successful. So, um, you know, generally people uh, saw a light at the end of the tunnel and, and eventually came around. And, and how do you differentiate yourself there? Because you are the most expensive, aren't you? Or one of the most expensive. 
Yeah, differentiation is key. I mean, you know, um, anytime you're selling a premium product, um, yeah. I think you have to you have to have uh, that differentiation because you know people will always argue. They'll say, "Hey, I can get it with this and do it for less." W- what's the difference? Yeah. And I think that's part and parcel on knowing the nuts and bolts of your product, whatever it is, uh, to be able to stand toe to toe with somebody and give them the facts that enable them to make a great decision. So. Uh, you change a lot of minds. Um, you know, you're an influencer. That's huge in the process. Doesn't always happen quickly, but but eventually you give them enough information where they can make a rational decision to to buy your product. And and how did you get evaluated as a salesperson? So we were evaluated like a lot of salespeople uh, uh, based on a success. Um, you know, not a lot of salespeople get. Uh, uh, evaluated too well on failure, uh, but you know, on success for sure. So, um, you know, like most jobs, it came uh, with a fairly um, comprehensive goal and usually secondary and tertiary goals to do other things. And, and as long as you were following step and, and fulfilling those goals, you know, most people were successful. Obviously, we have people who, who, who um, you know, in any sales organization would have people who don't uh, achieve plan and um, you know, there are consequences. So, you know, sales, you know, is a, is a um, high risk, high reward business. And uh, the risk is you may not work there. The reward is you may make lots of money. <laughs> risk. <laughs> but I mean, uh, so it was signing up accounts or was it the billables that went through the flow through the account? Sure. So signing up accounts. If you think about B2B today, um, you know, B2B is a $20 trillion dollar you know, piece of uh, real estate that's out there. Um, companies are buying and spending every day, you know, and they're looking to um, the most efficient way possible to put that spend through their organization. Uh, card companies uh, believe that putting it on plastic is the most efficient way. You know, there are alternatives such as check and ACH and all sorts of things like that that, that um, companies look at that, um, you know, you have to compete against. So we were looking at the spend that was going on our card and the other guys were looking at the spend that was going on their card uh, to be able to, um, to have success. And did you come up with the top down approach or was that kind of pushed on you or? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, I, I would tell you, uh, I spent 17 years as the national sales director. And in that time, I worked on a very definitive list of, prospect that didn't accept our product um you know and you couldn't really deviate from that list so you didn't have a lot of choice you had to be successful with them so you've got to develop uh, a rational plan to capture your business and, and i've always thought this way and i've always led this way in the sales process but um the, sh- the shortest distance between two points is a straight line yeah. and in sales we often have to take you know, different avenues around to get a decision. But I find that a top-down approach gives you the quickest uh, mandate within an organization. Because if it's not something that um, the organization is going to sanction, chances are you're not going to have much luck uh, at the lower rank. So starting above, getting a buy-in from somebody or a response from somebody, it can be as little as that. Uh, You can leverage that later on in your process with people below to say, hey, I spoke to your CFO, Tom, today, and Tom says he's interested. He'd like me to talk to you. Um, You know, and generally that person thinks, wow, he talked to our CFO. I better get on this because if I bump into Tom in the elevator today, I want to have something good to say to him. So a lot of that mindset goes into selling and the posturing and positioning that, um, you know, all of us do um, is very important. And when you contacted the CFO, they're not the most accessible and cooperative people, are they? <laughs> no, no. But I, I will tell you, some of the keys that I found over my career are, are back to basics. Like today, we've become very comfortable with instant technology and communication and tweeting and Facebook. And you know, I'm going to tell you, the, the, the tried and trusted methods of uh, writing a letter to a CFO or a CEO today. I mean, you think about it. If you go to your mailbox tonight and you open it up and you pull out a letter that's a handwritten envelope, I guarantee you it's the first letter that you open before the rest of the mail. Uh, People look at written communication today as outside of the normal channel and are somewhat a little taken back by it. And then 
be creative in the writing and you up your chances even further. So I would tell you, I wrote a lot of what seems to be an outdated method, but I wrote a lot of letters to CFOs and CEOs and mailed them through snail mail and sent them in the mail and would get about a 70% hit rate on that form of communication. Wow. Um, and, you know, it used to amaze me, but, you know, I think too, companies, when they see it in written format like that, feel obligated to respond to you or acknowledge the communication. And by the way, when you call up to follow up on the letter and you give a specific, you know, um, call to action within the document, um, people remember the document because normally you don't speak to the CFO when you call up, you speak to his assistant or VT voicemail, assistant yeah. or whatever. <laughs> you, you, you get a chance to reference that document. Yes. And yeah. It's useful in the conversation to build rapport. And was it like a, a veto type letter or was it, did you have a particular format that you found very effective? You know, I, I tried everything. Um, yeah. I, I've across the years, I, I, I've created my own. I, I've, I, I like every good salesperson. I've, I've found others that have created better than me and I've, I've stolen those ideas. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, uh, I'm not too proud to say that, um, you know, and I've constantly try to evolve the process and, and keep it fresh. Yeah. Um, because things change, terminology, technology, everything changes over time. And I think it's important, you know, to stay fresh with that stuff. So, you know, later in the uh, last few years, um, sometimes we would use email to that effect, but change the, the address line in the email to something that was quirky, you know, to get someone's attention. If you think about your email inbox every day, you get 150 emails and they all say the same, meeting for. A message from Tom, whatever it is, but you yeah. get something in there that has a different heading on it. People tend to take a look at it too, and it can be quirky. Um, it can be, um, you know, a little loud, a little brash, a little something that they normally don't see, and it captures their attention. I used to get a terrific response rate on that stuff too. Yeah, and what did you like about sales? You know, listen, sales is, it's funny you should ask that. So, so most people say when you meet people, you're having a drink and they say to you, what do you do for a living? They say I'm in sales. The first thing the non-sales people say is, oh, I could never do that. I, I actually can't imagine doing anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a personality. You know, people um, either have the, the ability to influence, and I don't even call it selling, but it's more the influence to communicate and influence them, then you have the ability to sell. Sell to me has a kind of a, a, a connotation to it that, that yeah. uh, most people look at and say, hey, I, I wouldn't do that as a career. But listen, in life, I have a philosophy. You're either a buyer or a seller. And I'd rather be on the selling side than the buying side. Right. I mean, you're essentially a professional communicator. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what were some of the stages that you went through when you were, went from being okay at sales to great at sales? Uh, you know, uh, well, great at sales. That's uh, I don't know if that's that's 100% accurate, but you know, you get better at it over time um, because you become more repetitive. You know, you yeah. repeat the same things over time. You get comfortable with them. Um, but I think when you when you have a command of the product that you're selling, um, that is when the game changes. So as you start and you're learning a product and you're learning, you know, technique and you're learning. Um, um, the other nuances of sales, it's harder as you get on in time. But I will tell you, the most important quality I think salespeople have is emotional intelligence and being able to read the room and who's opposite you, when to push, when not to push. These are things I don't think you can teach. I think these are things that are ingrained in innate in people. And, um, you know, I think later in my career, I, I would know when to push, when not to push when is the right time to step off, say something, um, read in the room who are the power brokers or not, um, you know, know when you should cut a contact and move around and go to the next person. Um, but, you know, th those are all things that you learn over time. I think you get better at. And, and how did you learn them other than just the reps? You know, repetition, failure. <laughs> um, you know, we all, we, we all go through it. You're out there, you know, you get punched in the nose and, and you come home from a trip and, and you've got nothing to show for it. And, 
and you and you self analyze and you say, well, what did I do wrong here? What yeah. what could I have done better? Um, you know, next time I go into this tomorrow, what am I going to say and and how am I going to handle that? And how am I going to communicate that to the person across the table to say, hey, you know what? I heard this yesterday and I made a mistake with that. I'm not going to make that with you today. Here's what I think. Um, so well, you know, being that, present, I guess. That, yeah, that one question, asking yourself, how could I do better? Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, have you ever had a perfect sales call? No. <laughs> not yet. No. No, no, those don't exist. Um, you know, there's always, just when you think it's going too perfect, somebody in the corner steps up and says something that you never would have anticipated. Uh, yeah. Or some wrinkle in the deal occurs that you never would have thought possible or an ask. Um, you know, but I, I think as you get better in your career, you get better at saying no in the sales process without actually saying no. Yeah. And I think that's key because... No is detrimental to the sales process, but if you can you can offer an alternative or a suggestion or something else um, without coming out with a hard no, we don't do that and we're never doing that. You know, soften that approach to give somebody the sense that you're really trying to work with them, uh, not against them. I think that's yeah. important. And that emotional intelligence. When did you kind of come to the epiphany of how important that was? Was it early in your career, or did you have a yeah, I, I, I took, um, you know, I always used to be telling people in sales that one of the most important things would be to study psychology, yeah. because I think psychology and selling are very closely akin. Uh, and I took some psychology classes and, and, and you know, start to dub it. My, my oldest son is a, has a degree in psychology, too, so he's, he's always seems to be working on me, it seems like. <laughs> okay. um, it's but, your uh, issue. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I, I think, you know, when I got behind, we, we did some training around, you know, uh, mirroring and, and yep. uh, nonverbal cues and body language. Body language is, is, is a tremendous asset to acquire um, when, you, when you're talking to somebody. You sit around, you know, people are sitting the opposite side of the table. And something simple as somebody sitting with their arms closed like that shows they're probably not taking in a lot of what you're saying um, you know, people obviously, you know, like sitting forward in a chair. There are ver nonverbal clues that you can you can key in. Where people sit in a room is yep. really important in a sales process. And you know, these are all things that you don't want to overwhelm yourself with, but you want to be aware of. So that right. situational awareness when you're in the sales process, so that um, you know you're giving yourself every chance for success. I, I mean, think about a a baseball player or a hockey player or a football player. They all practice their craft. They all practice two, three, four, five times a week. You know, people think that in the sales world, practicing is role playing. I, I don't know a single uh, salesperson alive that actually likes to role play. I, I hate it. But practicing in your head and practicing, you know, how I'm going to deal with this or reading about how I'm going to uh, handle the situation or latest technology, whatever that might happen to be, you need to stay up on your craft because that's really important. Yeah. I mean, early in my career, um, we used to do post-mortems after a face-to-face -face call for well over an hour after an hour meeting. And as a young guy, all of a sudden they brought up all these issues. I, I had no awareness of it all. I didn't pick that up at all. Yeah. But it was insanely valuable. Well, that. That, that's, a, that's a great point you bring up because, you know, as a sales leader, you have to be careful early in someone's sales process not to crush them too much because there's right. so much feedback you can give somebody yeah. uh, on, a, on a sales call. You know, hey, it didn't work. These are a couple of things to work on for this call. There might have been 10 things, but let's take it in small chunks. You know, let's work on these couple of things. We'll get to the others. You'll get better over time. Hopefully you get that much rope, but, you know, the, 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 the theory is to get better over time. And, and being a sales leader, I'm sure you noticed like the progression of people going from okay to great or better and better. Yeah. Yeah. What were some or, of those milestones that you see? Well, you know, um, I, I've had the great fortune of working with a lot of talented people over the years. Um, you know, exceptional, um, exceptionally smart people, um, intelligent people. And then some that, you know, <laughs> lacked a little bit too. I mean, you know, that's just the way it is. But, um, you know, I, I, I've worked with some people who weren't really, um, you know, didn't didn't start their careers as salespeople and morphed into it. And then, 
you know, we worked together to, to accentuate some of the great qualities that they had and make them exceptional salespeople. I think part of sales leadership is taking sales talent and making it better. I mean, yeah. that's the win. Um, and, and when you can do that and you can be successful at that, it's absolutely, you know, very rewarding. Um, but, you know, I, I've, I've had uh, seasoned sales execs work for me. I've had new people work for me. I've had uh, people that have come in from client management roles and take over and do that. So, you know, it's setting that vision for them and the expectation of what you want them to do and achieve. Uh, and if they have that inner desire and that personality of sales, then it tends to fall together for them. Yeah, if they, if they have the desire and that emotional intelligence or the, the grit to take feedback. Yeah, I love that word grit. You know, it, it applies across so many things, Brian. Yeah. Um, you know, grit is that, that, uh, that quality that you can't, you, you, you can't manufacture, you can't buy. Um, you know, it's as precious as time. Um, and, and when you have it, it's, it's, it's invaluable. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, people write books about it and, and uh, teach it and, you know, people want to grab it and buy it off the shelf. You can't, it, it, you either have it or you don't. Yeah. It's funny. I uh, invited the author of a book about grit to be on the show and they said they, they told me they were on a sabbatical and to get back to them in a year. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh that's grit. <laughs> Nice gig if you can get it. Huh? It's a good nice thing to gig. study it. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you don't have it. Ah, yeah. No, I and mean, you know, listen, the, the other things that, you know, affect salespeople too are not even the process of selling, but all the intangibles behind the scene that you can't control. So uh, you can only worry about the front of the house and what you can control. So, you know, it's a very complex career. I would, I would say people look at salespeople and say, you know, it's less onerous than engineering. I, I don't think so. I think any... Any profession, including it's people, it's right? People. Yeah, it's people. You know, and that's it. When people say, oh, I'm going to turn it into a science. Well, yeah, if every person was identical, maybe. Right. right, right. But, yeah. and I think, you know, certainly when people have kids, you start to understand how unique people are, right? Absolutely. Same DNA, same parents, pretty much the same time frame, yet they're completely different. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I have two boys and, they're very much different. They have similar, some similar traits, but two different people completely. Two different yeah. people. And can you, do you think you can teach that uh, emotional intelligence, the outward mindset to be able to understand how other people think? Um, you know, you can study it. Um, yeah. You can get better at it. But I think there are always people that are going to have an advantage who have the natural ability internally or innate ability to to have that leading capability, I call it. So, you know, to be able to sit across the table um, and, and kind of get into the mind of the people you're selling to. Yes. And, and but, but also, here's what's key, Brian, is having the ability to slow down the thought process in your own head to be really conducting two exercises at once. The emotional intelligence side, to be gauging the room and see what's going on, but also be selling your product at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, early in career, you do tend to get overwhelmed and it's all about pushing and presenting and presentations and that sort of stuff. And then later in career, you know, you walk in and like I used to walk into a lot of deals in my later career and I'd have one sheet of paper. Uh, you know, there wouldn't be a 40 page presentation. There's no crutches needed. It's all here. And it's yeah. what comes out of here and not what's on the paper, which, which what people buy. Right. Because they want a conversation. They don't want Absolutely. a lecture. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we and, just have this, we just have to say and throw up and, or, or show up and throw up, you know? And that's what a lot of reps um, are conditioned for and prepare for instead of come crafting some questions, some, you know, nonverbal listening skills. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think um, if you think more like a detective yep. at a crime scene and you know, you don't know anything and you want to know, um, there are so many things that, you know, come into selling, like you can be a detective or a reporter for a newspaper or a magazine and you don't know anything. You're trying to find the story, you know? So yeah. what do you do in that case? You ask a lot of questions, you know, try and put yourself in their customer's position. How, how do they do business? How do they sell to their customers? What do they sell? You know, when they sell them, what are the things that happen in that process? You know, 
B2B, um, the process of one business selling to another in itself is quite simple, but there could be huge complexities downstream from that Right. With, with regard to the product that you're selling and how it works, et cetera, implementation, you know, getting paid, how you get paid, when you get paid, those things, you know, you have to drill down into. But, you know, the very fact of them, one business selling to another business at the 10,000 foot level is very simple. It's you have to be able to immerse yourself downstream. Right. Because it, it's all about people changing and people, that's not a natural act. No. And, and most people, I think, don't like change. I'm not a change change <laughs> well, myself. Right. I mean, you know, you get up every morning. Okay. What's going to be different about my day today? What am I changing about myself? Why do new year's resolutions not work? This has right. changed. Right. Right. But isn't that one of the great things about sales, Brian, is you get up every day and it never is the same. No, it, it's, 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 you know, I, I mean, imagine this and I, I, I'll give you this. I used to be a, a pilot and, um, I love flying airplanes, but think of them, how mundane being a pilot is. You know, yep. you probably saw the first part of Tom Cruise's movie. Um, I'm trying to think where he was the drug smuggler and he was a pilot and he got bored doing the same thing, going to the same cities every single week. Yep. In sales, we never do that. We talk to new people every day. We have different situations. We're traveling to different places. It's constantly new, which is refreshing in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and, you know, if that's something that you can deal with, you know, selling it proves out to be a, a tremendous career. And I love the detective metaphor because it, what you're really trying to do as a detective is how do you use your time most appropriately to find who committed this crime? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you looked at most sales leaders today, they would say, go talk to everybody in that town. Well, yeah, I could do that in a year, but. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've watched some of your videos and some of them are so on point with um, I'm wasting exercises. You know, detectives don't have limitless quantities of time either. They have to figure out who are the suspects yep. very quickly and then find out the facts to, to charge those people. Um, you know, as a salesperson, like I said before, you're trying to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. You can. I, I, I don't know a salesperson alive that says, listen, I'm going to elongate this sales process. Right. So I can <laughs> this is going way too fast. Yeah. This is going way too fast. You know, most sales, or you're going to give me a prospect and I won't call on it today because I don't want to sell them. Yeah. You know, you get a lead. Most great salespeople are on that immediately and figuring out and, and trying to, you know, determine whether there's legs to this opportunity or not. They don't leave them sit on the side. And if they are leaving them sit on the side, then they're not a very good salesperson. So, you know, there are some things that go on internally in organizations that you look at, you scratch your head and go, you know, uh, just trust in the talent. The talent usually will do the right thing. And, and to be a great detective, you've got to think about who has the motive to commit that crime. Absolutely. Emotionally, Absolutely. logically, and yeah. that is so much like sales because you look at your CRM and they all look the same, but you've got to ask yourself, not who would I like to close, but who's most likely to close. Absolutely. Because again, you're not sitting around saying, listen, I'm going to go after the most difficult things and waste <laughs> as much time as possible. You yeah. know, you're trying to find the ones that will close as quickly as possible, get them through your pipeline and then cash out. on them. I mean, you know, let's be real. Most people are in sales um, because they want to make money. Yes. And, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing embarrassing about that. Um, if that's what motivates you, then guess what? You're probably better off in sales than you are in project management. Right. Because there's probably more money in sales. So you're not sitting around there figuring out ways not to close things. Great salespeople are figuring out ways to actually refine the system, find the suspect, solve the case. Yep. What is that need behind there? Who's buying? Why? You know, asking the right question, not sitting in a room with 40 people and wondering who the decision maker is. Get in the room with 40 people and ask the question, who is the decision maker? Who yeah. will ultimately make this? How do we get to that point? How do you guys buy? How do you guys typically buy? You know, and, and the more questions you ask, uh, the more answers you will get. Now, sometimes, you know, companies are a little tricky. They'll try and evade you and, and, and not Much like a detective, right? Sure. 
the criminal's not going to tell you the truth. <laughs> no, no, no. Because what does it mean for most organizations? Change. Change. It means them doing something that Work. they're not doing today. Work. Uncom- they have to risk. Do. Absolutely. So you've got to make them comfortable as you're, you're uncovering these things. You know, the, the, the great side of, of buying your product or what yeah. are the advantages or how easy it's going to be. And, and experiences that others have had so that it leads them to believe that you're just not telling them something that you want them to hear, that there's truth behind it, that somebody else has had a great experience. And was there a particular tell that you could recognize in the meeting of who really is what I, they call the fox or the, the maverick or the, the person who, if you convince, is going to be you know, the champion, the, the action person? Well, you know, uh, I'll give you this analogy. You know, when uh, a couple go or two partners go out to buy something in a, in, and one wants it and one doesn't, you normally find that the one that wants it joins with the salesperson to sell against the person who doesn't want it. It's yeah. actually comical to watch. But in, in, in large B2B sales that we were involved in, you would always get one person in the room that would give it up, that they would start selling with you against their colleagues. Well, you know, if we did this, this would be a great thing for us to have because of X and Y. And, and the key there is to shut the hell up and let those people do their own right. internal battling and let yeah. them hatch it out. But once you got to that stage, you could generally see that there was a faction internally that wanted what we had and wanted what we were selling. Yeah, kind of like in The Godfather when um, Fredo was trying to convince Michael of uh, not to beat up on, um, what yes. was his name, Mo Green or, or something. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> in that Vegas scene. Yes, yes. In my space, the, the tell was always the the key person was never in the meeting at the beginning. They'd always come in like the last 10 minutes because they wanted to see the reaction of all the other people. And as soon as they came in the meeting, all heads turned. Hey, I can only stay 10 minutes yeah. and then wind up staying the full hour. Yeah. Now they, you know you've got something to play with. And they had the educated questions where you knew they did some research. They know the real issues. Absolutely. They're, they're not kicking tires. They've, they've looked at other people. and Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to connect with you and learn more about you? LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. Roger McNamara on LinkedIn. Um, you know, happy to talk to anybody out there. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity of coming on with you today. I hope you enjoyed that. That was a fun conversation. And I could talk with great salespeople all day. And I pretty much do. But when you hear uh, the passion about selling, the excitement, uh, the determination, the competitiveness, uh, and the focus, these are all things that we need to develop. And, you know, some people say, oh, you've got to be born with uh, the gift of gab or a people person. Ah, uh, you know, I, I certainly wasn't. And a lot of the people that I see great in sales aren't. If you've noticed, not one person has been that gregarious, glad fly, uh, bat back slapping type of sales guy that we all think of as the best of the best. No, these are all kind of down to earth, nice people who have learned how to connect with other people. And that ability, we think, is something that can just be scripted because eh, you, you can uh, write down the words, you can write down the transcript and read them, but that's a, not a performance. That is just being a robocall, and we've got to get away from it. And we think we can do it with email. We think we can do it uh, with cold calling, but they've been burnt. Uh, the market has been torched. They've got defense mechanisms. They've got spam filters. They've got uh, voicemail that keeps it from them. But yet, what do we do on our weekends? We meet with our friends. We crave that. We desire to be part of a tribe. And we like to spend time with our friends, people we enjoy talking with. And guess what? That might be a great way to sell. And that's what Start the Conversation, Get the Meeting is all about. I teach you the steps of creating an organic conversation and then how to turn it into a business conversation, not a pitch, a conversation. 
have you seen that all of these interviews? Nobody is talking about the magic words or their value proposition or their elevator pitch. That's what you hear on other podcasts from people who haven't sold or don't know how to sell enterprise, don't know how to connect with strangers. If you want to find out if somebody's interested, yeah, sure, you can ask, you can pitch, but what's the likelihood that you will find that or that you can create that in a couple of minutes on the phone? That's It's so not just old school, but it's ineffective because you're not getting their time, first of all. Second, Uh, the likelihood that you're going to find the right person at the right moment is so minuscule. And people assume that they don't need your stuff, even though they might. And what you really want to do is find the people who are most likely to and build that curiosity from nothing into something. That is real selling. And when you hear people make that epiphany, and what I'm going to start doing is taking sound clips from the office hours and the one-on-ones of the successes. Because when the lights go on, people are like, this is fun. This isn't a hassle. This is so nice because one person said, you know, once I get uh, an organic conversation, I do really well. I go, that's the point. That is the objective. But guess what? Uh, that that front up front piece getting to there is a systematic way takes a little bit of time. You can't do it in a minute, but you can do it in a couple of days. It's not like we're t- I'm talking about months or years or nurturing or spamming people. I'm talking about approaching people the way they want. And you know, people say, well, does it take a year? Well, it, it takes a lifetime to become great at it, but you can become fantastic at it within a year. You can learn it in a couple of weeks to a month. It takes a little bit of practice, takes a mind shift, takes a little bit of patience, a little bit of feedback, a little bit of reflection and and sticking with it and listening to how other people are doing it. Because I really encourage you to listen to the one-on-ones in the course. I wouldn't offer them if I knew this didn't work. This is how I built my business when I went out on my own. Imagine being a solopreneur with no name recognition the product is me. Uh, You know, yeah, I had written a book, but come on, it was, uh, it wasn't a bestseller. It did really well in Audible, but uh, you know, it, it, you know, it wasn't like a book takes 10 years in the business market to really become known. And uh, I didn't have that 10 years, nor did I want to wait 10 years. I learned how to connect in organic conversations with the toughest people out there, sales leaders. Believe me, they're tough. I know if you're selling to them. Now, the other course, Closing the Complex Sale, I teach what no one else does. It's how companies buy and how to build your process to keep the deal moving. The default is no decision, no action, status quo. Call it what you want. But the people who keep the deal moving and guide the client through the process. And so few people understand this, know how to do it, anticipate it, put it into their process to keep it moving. We had several people in the course uh, sell the biggest deals in the company's history uh, recently. Uh, And I really appreciate the people who send me the pictures of President's Club. That really, I mean, that's, that's my objective. You know, people, oh, you're just trying to sell your course. I want to get reimbursed for my time and uh, what I do. But it's if you look at the prices, they're not super high. Most people are shocked at how low they are. I price it for individuals. Uh, There's a couple of managers with a couple of reps in there. But I really want it to be a community of reps who want to become great at sales. And the way to do that is consistent practice on the real important things. And I'm not teaching you the stuff that everybody else does. I'm teaching you the complex sale, how it works, the tools that I have used when I did it over 25 years doing seven-figure deals and complex enterprises. And people, oh, does it match my business? Well, if you're in B2B and there's more than a couple of people, bigger than mom and pop, it can be SMB. But the bigger, the more it matches, because what happens is we are selling something that makes sense, that they have a need for, they have the money for it, but they don't know how to get it done, 
or it's just one of the many things that they would like to get done. How do we get it on the top of their priority list? How do we keep the ball moving? Because the default is for it to stop. You know, getting the meeting is a big hard part. Uh, having the meeting is the easy part. Keeping the deal moving and closed is the hard part. And I really am trying to focus on that. Also, I'm, I'm putting up some great stuff on the B2B Revenue Leadership Show. Um, they are leaders, but a lot of what they talk about is still great selling. So if, if you want kind of more of, of this type of podcast, listen to that one because most of the guests, are almost all of them are in sales. Some are in marketing, uh, but recently has been mostly sales leaders who've worked their way up and I, I only have the really good ones. I don't have the, you know, beat the reps up type leaders or, you know, the army type leaders. I have the people who really are staying at companies for a long time and want their reps to. So they might be great people to, to work for, but when you hear how they describe leadership and in sales and building their organization, it, it really helps you understand, especially if you want to get into leadership or you want to understand what a great sales leader does. B2B Revenue Leadership Show. My website is b2brevenue.com. Check out the show notes for all the good deals. Our partners over at Pipe Drive and CoVideo who help support the podcast, I appreciate them. Great products. I use them myself. And you can schedule a time to talk with me over on my b2brevenue.com. Uh, I allocate you know 15 minute slots uh, to answer your questions, make sure it's the right match for you. Uh, all the content in the course and the one on ones and the office hours are given by me. Uh, no, no assistant. And you can just tell the passion I have for sales and helping you get to your goal and develop your skills as a rep. We'll see you next time.